morning, everyone, and welcome to our service at Northwest Barrie. It's Sunday, April 25th. Well, actually, it's Thursday because, of course, that's when we're, we're uh, taping the service, so there's snow on the ground. Hopefully, uh, as you're watching on Sunday, the snow is all gone. Uh, anyway, we're doing the second in our series of looking at the Ten Commandments. And uh, as I said uh, last week, we're also going to try and start each service by being somewhere that's related in Barrie to, to the actual commandment for the day. So, hence, I'm standing out front of this beautiful statue uh, of a dragon that was just put up here just a couple of years ago. Um, the reason I'm out here is because if this had been back in the three or four hundreds AD, this statue would never have lasted. Back then when the, the early Christian community was getting stronger and Rome was declining, uh, Christians went on a rampage and basically defaced or destroyed any statue they could get their hands on. Um, the reason being was because they believed that, that, that they contravened the second commandment, which is, thou shalt not worship false idols, which is what we're talking about today. Sadly, that kind of thing happened even later on, and, and uh, when, when Christians came to the shores of, of uh, North America and uh, first met uh, indigenous cultures here, um, a lot of their artwork and their craft work and their statues were destroyed for the same reason. So it's a, a very contentious uh, commandment, thou shalt not worship false idols. How do we look at a commandment like that today through modern eyes? So that's what we're going to tackle today. So I'm getting out of the cold and back into the church, and we'll see you there in a couple of minutes. Well, good morning again, and, uh, and again, welcome to our service at Northwest Ferry. We're so glad that you could join us on this Sunday morning. As always, we like to begin with our celebrations and uh, just have one to uh, pass along this week. You know, I love the fact that we have people from watching um, from all over Canada and, and actually a um, few people even beyond our borders. We have a very faithful watcher in Quebec, and that is Patricia Lindsay, and uh, her sister is a member here, Margaret Maxwell. And I hear that Patricia is having a birthday this week. So uh, happy birthday, Patricia. Uh, bon anniversaire, I think might be the right thing to say. Hopefully it is. Sorry if I said the wrong thing. But anyway, happy birthday from all of us here at Northwest. Um, I'd just like to share before we get to the announcement something uh, neat that kind of happened this week. If you were watching the service last week, I started the service by standing outside the Am Shalom uh, Synagogue here in Barrie. And as a way of thanks for letting us use that space, I just dropped off a, a note of thanks for them. Anyway, I had a really nice call and an email back from one of the leaders of the synagogue uh, inviting us to join them at any time for uh, an interfaith meal or an event. They'd love to build bridges between our two faith communities, which is super cool. But I also like something else he said. Uh, he said that they, of course, couldn't do anything right now because of the pandemic. Um, but So he said everything is closed, and that is out of respect of a principle in their faith in their faith tradition called Shmirat Hanafesh, which is a Hebrew phrase, and it's translated to mean to protect life. I thought what a great way of sharing in the language of faith what we're all trying to do right now by staying home. Shmirat Hanafesh, we're all trying to protect life. Just a couple of uh, announcements this week. Our big question continues on Wednesday mornings. This is our final one, at least for this season. And it begins, as always, at 10.30 on Wednesday. If you're interested in taking part, you can uh, do so by signing up uh, via Northwest News. And then on Wednesday night, we're having uh, our movie discussion night. And the movie I selected for, uh, for this week is called The Dig. And you can find it on Netflix. It's a drama starring Ralph Fiennes. Um, really a very touching, very beautiful movie based on a real story. So... Highly recommend it if you want to watch it this week and then uh, sign up to join us for the discussion on Wednesday. We'd love to have you. And once again, you can find the link on Northwest News. And we are continuing with our outreach project, Easter to Easter, an attempt to raise uh, $800 to purchase a custom-made car seat for a disabled child through the Easter Seals. And uh, again, all the details, uh, you can find those on the Thursday edition of Northwest News. And once again, as I said last week, our church remains closed indefinitely. So if you do need to get in touch with anyone, anyone on staff, or we're continuing to work, uh, you can do so via phone or email. And we'll be sure to let you know 
uh, when those restrictions have been loosened. For our call to worship today, I'd like to share the words of a hymn that are in uh, one of our hymn books, Boar Voices. And uh, this hymn was actually originally from China and was translated into English. It's called, Holy Spirit, You Are Like the Wind. Listen now for these opening words. Holy Spirit, you're like the wind blowing gently above the trees. Where the wind blows, the flowers bloom. Where the wind blows, there is life. May it blow, O oh, blow over me. I pray that it shall never cease. Holy Spirit, you bring the springtime. Like muted flowers, fragrance outpour. Holy Spirit, you're like a spring flowing over mountain or a fall. Like a river that flows with power, there to nourish the trees and fields. May you richly nourish me, that I may, be, may bear fruit abundantly, ever bearing the fruits of life that depend on life-giving dew. Amen. And in that spirit of springtime and newness, we're going to uh, begin with our opening hymn, Great Spring Hymn, and uh, All Things Bright and Beautiful. I know you know it, so feel free to sing along. I invite you to join me in our opening prayer and let us pray. Creator God, you've joined us in welcoming the warmth of spring, the warmth of seasons, the warmth of community, the warmth of new life. We come to worship today with worries and uncertainty, fear of change and loneliness. And yet with all that we bring, we also give thanks for friends, for new beginnings and fresh starts, for familiarity and comfort, and your love that helps us to know that we are not alone. We come to welcome all that is bright and beautiful around us and within us. Welcome us so that we might find our peace in you. Amen. Really thrilled to have uh, Trish and Dave, uh, who are going to lead us in our special music today. Enjoy. It's the ordinary things of our ordinary lives that display the greatest of our God above. It's the ordinary things of our ordinary lives so that when we open up our eyes we see the extraordinary love of God in our friendships and our families in love's warm embrace in our joys and in our 
trials and when someone shows us grace it's the ordinary things of our ordinary lives that display the greatest of our god Thanks to uh, Dave and to Trish. Once again, during this uh, online offering time, I'd like to thank everybody for their contribution to the work of our church. I want you to imagine I have in my hand a package of seeds because I was going to bring one today and I, I left it at home. So you know what a package of seeds looks like. But I, I bought it because in the New Testament, uh, Making an offering is compared to planting a seed. And I've always thought that's a really good analogy, especially at this time of year. A seed in itself is nothing spectacular or beautiful. Its beauty is in what it eventually becomes. A gift to a church or to any organization works the same way. Its beauty is in the gift that it becomes. We are who we are and where we are because of all the seeds planted here and developed in this wonderful, vibrant, caring, colorful church community. I know over the next few weeks, many of us will be planting seeds of our own in, in, uh, in our gardens, that they will give us a harvest of beauty and goodness. So again, my thanks for the figurative seeds that you continue to invest here, for you are planting nothing short of hope in these times, investing not only in today, but in the future of what will become again when we finally reach tomorrow's better days. Thank you. Before I have the message today, um, I'd like to share with you uh, a reading from the Bible. Last week I shared the story of Moses uh, bringing the Ten Commandments to the people um, from Mount Sinai. We sometimes imagine that Moses went up, got the commandments, and came down. But if you read carefully, it actually says that he was up on the mountain for quite a few days. We don't know exactly how long, but a significant portion of time. So, while he was on the mountain, all kinds of things were taking place with the people at the bottom of the mountain. And I'd like to share some of what was going on at the bottom of the mountain. And it's uh, starting to read, or I'm going to be starting to read from chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, they all gathered around Aaron and they said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. 
As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Very well. Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it into a mold, and cast an image of a golden calf. And they said, This is your God, the God of the Egyptians. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation, saying, Tomorrow shall be a festival to this God. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. As Moses came down from the mountain and came near, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned hot. He threw the tablets from his hand. He took the calf that they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, and scattered it over the water. Then Moses faced them and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. Amen. This morning, I'm continuing, as I said earlier, with our series called Tuning Up to Ten, looking at the Ten Commandments. And today, we're going to look at commandment number two, which says, you shall have no other idols before me. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. You know, as if we have enough, don't have enough to worry about in the midst of COVID-19, we have another great catastrophe that we have to think about. Friends, the world is running out of these things. Garden gnomes. I'm not actually joking. Maybe you heard the story on the news this week. The alarm bells started ringing in England, a country that loves their garden gnomes. Nobody could find them. The shelves were empty. Well, the problem, it turns out, could be traced all the way back to that ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. Remember that a couple of weeks ago? A ship trying to get through the canal got turned around and got lodged. And for days, uh, no ships could pass through. Hundreds of ships were stranded and billions of dollars of the economy were lost. Well, apparently one of those ships was filled with garden gnomes and it never made it to port. For all we know, it's still out there sailing somewhere in the ocean. The result... The world is running out of gnomes. Now, what do you think about garden gnomes? By the way, I got this one from uh, from Brian Weeks. It turns out that he doesn't have just one garden gnome. He's got many of them. He kind of likes to to collect them. So um, next time you're talking to Brian and uh, you ask how his his family is, um, make sure he's telling you about his girls and not his gnomes. Anyways, thank you to Brian for lending it. I will definitely take good care of it. You know, personally, I love these little things. I think they bring a little joy and a little fun uh, to a garden. Uh, Nothing wrong with garden gnomes. But what if I were to take this little guy into my house, set up a little shrine in his honor, and then kneel down and pray to him? What would you do? Well, at first, I hope you would probably call a doctor. But in reality, I would be breaking the second commandment which reads, you shall not worship false idols. Don't worry, I don't love garden gnomes that much. But I I will be looking at the Weeks house next time I'm there to see if there's any little altar set up. Just kidding, Brian. Thanks again. Do not worship false idols. That's a very contentious commandment that has led over the years to a great deal of animosity, destruction, prejudice, within the church, but also within the faith community. Muslims accusing Buddhists of idol worship. Protestants accusing Catholics of idol worship. What is a false idol? Well, before we get there, the logical question is, what is an idol? According to the definition, at least in a religious context, an idol is any symbol or statue or object that attempts to represent the divine or to represent God. 
in essence, idols represent the human need to give form to what is invisible. Humans are much better at understanding things they can see and touch than simply the idea of a spirit. So how do you make an invisible God become real? You create a figure out of it. And we've always done it. In fact, let me show you an example of the earliest form of an idol. It's over one of my shoulders here that you're looking at. These are called Venus figurines, and they've been found all over Asia. And they go back to prehistoric days. They're believed to be the oldest forms of idols or depictions of the divine. Well, and since then, every empire, community, culture, race, people have created their own unique idols to capture the essence of the divine, including the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Romans, and so on. And even in indigenous cultures, including right here in Canada, there's a rich history and tradition of creating images, often in the form of animals, to capture again the divine or the sacred. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, I guess it depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I'm always going to say no. I don't believe there's anything wrong with it at all. In fact, I think it's very healthy. It can be very spiritually healthy. If the goal of faith is to try to understand God and to live within the grace-filled, loving presence of God, then objects or symbols can often help us to do that. I often carry around with me in my pocket a little rock, and on the rock it says, Peace. And if I'm in a situation where I might feel a little overwhelmed or anxious, I'll put my hand in my pocket and just run my finger over that word, and it just kind of keeps me in that place of, of calm and relaxation. Is that an idol? I suppose some may say that it is. But for me, it's something tangible. A bridge, if you will, between me and the invisible presence of God. That's what objects like that can be like. A bridge leading deeper into the heart of the sacred or the divine. And I bet if you think about it, you have your own similar kind of idols. Maybe a painting that particularly moves you when you, take a look, when you look at it. Or a statue or sculpture that has deep meaning for you. On my desk in my office, I have an Anukchuk, that Inuit symbol that would guide travelers over the frozen tundra in the days before GPS. I have it there to remind me that I, too, am a traveler through life. I, too, am in need of guidance on my journey. I've always thought in many ways the symbols that we have are kind of like the adult version of a child's teddy bear or security blanket. Children need love and warmth and security. And when a parent isn't around, a blanket can symbolize that deep need for connection. We eventually outgrow our blankets and our teddy bears, but we never outgrow the need to know that we are loved and connected, secure, and safe. And sometimes symbols, pictures, objects can keep us in that place of connection, that place of love. In other words, I think human beings need real, tangible things that they can hold, look at, feel, ponder, reflect on, that soften the hard edges of life, or ease a burdened mind, or move a tired spirit, or relocate a lost soul back into the heart of God. Doesn't mean we're worshiping those things, but it means it's helping us to make that bigger connection. And if a peace rock in your pocket, a painting on your wall, a beads around your neck, a statue on your desk can help you to do that, then more power to you. And that's why I've never been on board with any church or any faith's preoccupation with rooting out anything that could be considered as competing for the attention of God. Because there has been, as I said at the beginning, a nasty history of that, particularly in the Protestant church, who back in the days desecrated beautiful and cherished symbols of faith in the Catholic church, believing they constituted idolatry. No one did it better than the Puritans, that super fundamentalist group of Christians in England who ended up coming to America. Do you know that the, the Puritans, when they were in power, 
actually outlawed the hanging of even a cross in the church, claiming that the cross was a false idol. And then they canceled Christmas, claiming that celebrating Christmas was a false idol. It's not a fun religion to be a part of. They would never have let me keep my nukchuk or let Brian keep his gnome. So how do we understand this commandment to avoid worshiping false idols? How can it speak to us today? Well, I think it can have something very profound to say to us today, but understanding it means understanding the difference between a bridge and a barrier. A good idol is one that helps us to bridge our relationship to the sacred. A false idol is one that creates a barrier to the sacred. Let me explain by telling you again the story of what was going on at the bottom of the mountain while Moses was up chatting with God and getting the Ten Commandments. We read again in Exodus that Moses was on the mountain for a few days. And while he was there, his people started to lose faith in him. He's never coming back, they cried. And not only that, but this God he keeps talking about clearly seems to have abandoned us, if he ever existed at all. They were scared. They were lost. They were uncertain. And so they said, well, let's worship something else, something tangible. So what they did was they gathered up all the gold jewelry they could find, melted down, and created it into a gold calf. What's so special about a golden calf? The golden calf was an Egyptian symbol of faith. Where were the Israelites trying to escape from? Egypt, where they spent generations in captivity as slaves. How weird is that? They were worshiping something that represented their own captivity. It's actually not that weird at all. And let me tell you why. It wasn't the first time that the Israelites had pined for Egypt. Earlier on the journey, they complained to Moses that they were hungry and tired and scared. They suggested that they go back into slavery because at least they had some security in life and some food rather than this nomadic, uncertain existence. But Moses had said to them, be patient, trust the journey. We can't go backward. And so reluctantly, they kept moving forward. And now as soon as Moses' back is turned, they start giving in to that fear and that worry again. They start to lose faith. And instead of looking forward, they want to turn back. Maybe if we worship the Egyptian god, life will get better. Moses finally comes off the mountain, sees his people dancing around this symbol of their slavery, and he smashes the calf to pieces and admonishes them for worshiping this false idol rather than trusting in the God that was taking them into their future. I didn't actually share this part of the story, but it actually says in the Bible that after he, scr- he smushed it up into, into uh, dust, he put the dust in the water, and then he made the Israelites drink the dust. Almost like a parent washing out a child's mouth for saying the wrong thing. A horrible thing to do, by the way. Anyway. The story leads me to ask this question. What was the false idol in that story? Was it the object? The calf? Well, that's the general assumption. But what if it was actually something else? After all, a calf, like an anukchuk, like a garden gnome, is just an object. It has no inherent power. It's not a god. It's a symbol. Wasn't the real false idol in this their uncertainty? Their desire to return to old patterns of life rather than trust in what could be new? Wasn't the real false idol their own fear? I want to ask you a very deep and profound question. This isn't a a question I could do an entire sermon series on, but... But here goes, and I'll tell you how it relates to idols. What do you believe is the ultimate goal of a life of faith? Is it to perfect ourselves? Is it to serve others? Is it to get to heaven? Is it to please God? Is it to appease God? How you answer that question is actually very important. 
because it will in so many ways decide the road that you will take to get to that goal. It's like finding a spot on a map. If you want to go to Collingwood, you're going to take this road. You want to go to North Bay, you're going to take this road. You want to go to Montreal, you're going to take this road. You're going to get turned around to the border, but you're at least going to start out on that road. How you answer the question of what is the ultimate goal of your faith largely determines the road through life that you will take. If your goal is to get to heaven, you will take a road of, of trying for moral purity. That will be your primary road. If your goal is to serve others, then your path through life will be one that is very altruistic. If your goal of your faith is to be perfect, you're going to strive after that and probably give yourself an ulcer and so forth. Let me tell you what I believe is the ultimate goal of faith. To me, the ultimate goal of a life of faith is to live into the fullness of our own being. I believe that's what Jesus was talking about when he said the kingdom of God is within you. That doesn't mean that we strive to be perfect. It means that we always strive to be fully ourselves, to maximize the gifts that we have, to live a life of openness to friend and stranger, to be confident and self-assured with who we are. Or as Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, do not let your light shine, or do not hide your light under a barrel, but let your light shine. A life lived in its fullness is a shining light. I believe that when we live into the fullness of ourselves, when we are all that we can be, God starts to live through us, creating around us the kingdom of God. When we live full, gifted, mature, open, courageous, confident lives, we create those things around us. We become a channel for God's spirit to work in the world. If you look at all the biggest shining lights of the world, those amazing people who have shifted history along, they might have different ideas, different faiths, different philosophies, but they all have one thing in common. They were all living into the fullness of their own beings. So why don't we get there? Why don't we become the best version of ourselves? Simply, because of false idols. Go back to that story of the Israelites and the golden calf. Why don't we get where we want to go? Fear. That's why we don't get there. Fear was what led the Israelites to create the golden calf. Fear was what led the Israelites to be tempted to go back to old patterns and places that weren't good for them. Fear was what led them to question the very providence of God. And Moses, by smashing the calf, wanted them to start embracing their destiny, start believing in their future, to start believing in themselves. You all, a lot of you know the quote that I'm going to put up on the screen in just a moment. It's, uh, it's being shared so often. I've shared it here so often. But it truly is a marvelous quote. It's by Mary Ann Williamson, and it really speaks to what this is all about. So I'm going to put it on the screen, and I'm going to share it with you once again. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, 
our presence automatically liberates others. Moses should have shared that quote with the Israelites because it's so true. We fear our own potential. And here's where false idols come in. When we live in fear, we start creating or embracing things that reinforce our fear. These are the false idols. These are the barriers to God. And there are so many of them. Let me just share just a handful of them. Materialism and consumerism can be a false idol for lots of reasons. One of them is because materialism tells us that we are, are not good enough without the best clothes or the best car or the best house. Gossip and criticism, it's a great false idol. We tear someone down because then we can feel better about who we are. We fear looking bad, so we make somebody else look bad instead. Anger is a false idol. When we feel we can't control our life or our situation, we lash out. We blame, hurt, diminish someone that feeds our fear. Addiction is a false idol. Addiction is a way of numbing the fear we feel, giving us temporary relief, but in the end, creating so many more problems. Jealousy and envy are false idols. You're always wondering what others can do or have rather than giving thanks for what you have been gifted with. But here's the big one. The biggest false idol when it comes to living into the fullness of ourselves, it's the failure to believe in ourselves. If as people of faith, we truly take Jesus' word seriously, that the kingdom of God is within us, that the presence of the sacred is at our very core, then really a failure to believe in ourselves is kind of a failure to believe in God. Weird, right? But it's logical. It kind of makes sense. The story of the Israelites and the golden calf is a story of that group of people not believing in themselves, not believing they had a destiny, not believing they had a future. And so what did they do? They mentally turned themselves around and took themselves back to slavery. Let's worship an object of our confinement. Why? Because of fear. Years ago, I made a really bad decision. It actually had a good outcome. But at the time, it was not a good decision. I finished theology school. I had done my internships. I would, was ready for ministry. And back then, we had to go through something called settlement. They don't have that in the church now uh, for those going to ministry, but they did back then. Basically, it's where you, you put your name into a hat and then the church decides where you get sent for your very first experience in ministry. There was a couple of good reasons for it. Number one, it allowed um, small churches that couldn't find ministers to get a minister. Um, and it was also the idea that uh, it was a leap of faith and, and, and trusting that in the process that you were meant to be where you were meant to be. So I submitted myself to that process and I got a call saying that I had been settled in a small three-point charge just northeast of Toronto, somewhere between Toronto and, and Peterborough. Well, I came up with every good reason why I couldn't go. I just started dating my wife, for one. I didn't have a car and didn't think I'd have enough money to buy myself a car. Maybe I could stay at home and continue to work for Parks and Recreation, as I had for that summer, and, and make some money. I could, I could go next year. I built my own golden calf. Because do you know the real reason why I didn't want to go? I was scared. I was terrified of being a young minister. I was 25, being a young minister in a church. I, I didn't think I was wise enough. I didn't think I'd had enough experience. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't mature enough. So instead of embracing the future, I went back to old patterns. I remember going back to the Parks and Rec where I had been working and I felt so depressed. Why? Because I knew I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I knew I wasn't where God wanted me to be. It wasn't my destiny. Now, as I said, 
it all worked out. A month later, the church of Beaton called and, and hired me for eight months. And while they were searching for a new minister, and then eight months turned into seven years, and then seven years turned into 25 years of ministry. But even going to Beaton, I knew I only had to be there for eight months and I could get out of it. I was still driven by fear because I didn't believe in myself. I didn't believe in my destiny and I didn't believe that God would sustain me through that. Fear is a powerful, powerful false idol in life. My point is today, was Moses really angry at the people because they were worshiping a golden object? Maybe. Or was he angry because they didn't believe in him, in God, or in what was ahead? They didn't believe that the divine, that God had a plan for them, and thus they were settling for a lesser destiny for themselves. What are false idols? They are anything that creates a barrier between you and God, whether you believe God is out there or whether you believe God is in here. Consumerism, criticism, anger, addiction, lack of confidence, jealousy, these are the modern false gods in life. These are the golden calves that we have to watch out for. God couldn't care less if you want to walk around carrying this in one hand and, and a bunch of prayer beads in the other hand, if that's what makes you feel good, if that's helping you to, to stay connected. But if what you're carrying is fear, self-doubt, well, then there's a problem. So what are the good idols? It's simple. You just hold up a mirror to the false ones and you see them. They are the bridges to God rather than the barriers. Instead of a life of materialism and consumerism, there's a life of service and love. Identify with not with what you have, but with who you are. Instead of gossip, criticism, and anger, there's encouragement, faith, and generosity because these are the things that open your heart. Instead of addiction, which I know is a hard one to break, but often arises out of fear of being hurt. There's self-compassion and there's gentleness of being, which invites healing and hope. Instead of envy and jealousy, there's courage to tend your own light and keep it shining. Instead of self-doubt that you are not good enough, there is self-assurance that you have a unique gift to share. The ultimate goal of faith is living into the fullness of your being and to avoid the trap of fear. For that, those are the only things that want to take you back to being enslaved. A little girl named Megan, I'm going to end with this. A little girl named Megan lost her first tooth. She was six years old. Her parents told her to put her tooth under her pillow for the tooth fairy. When her parents came in later that night to retrieve the tooth from under the pillow, they found, a note, uh, they found it wrapped in a note. This is what the note said. Dear Tooth Fairy, please leave me your magic wand. I can help. I want to be a Tooth Fairy too. Love, Megan. Her parents recognized this note as a great moment and a great opportunity to encourage their daughter. So they wrote the following note back to Megan and left it under her pillow. Dear Megan, I have worked hard to be a good tooth fairy and I love my job. You are too young for the job right now, so I cannot give you my wand. But there are some things that you can start to do to prepare yourself for the job. Number one, always do your best in every job that you do. Number two, Treat all people as you wish yourself to be treated. Number three, be kind and helpful to others. Number four, always listen carefully when people are speaking to you. I will interview you one day when you are older and ready for the job. Until then, I'm letting you keep your tooth to remember this special day. Good luck, Megan. Love, the Tooth Fairy. Megan was thrilled at the response from the Tooth Fairy. 
She took the message to heart, carefully followed the instructions, always working to improve as she grew. Her character, her strength, her leadership grew right along with her. After graduating from college, Megan accepted a challenging management position. She excelled and by the age of 27, she was the top manager of the company. One day, Megan was asked by the company president what influences had motivated her towards success. And she replied, my parents, my teachers, my friends. And then she reached into her purse, pulled out a tiny little string bag, removed a tooth, and said, and of course, the tooth fairy. Keep your gnomes. Keep your peace rocks. Keep your beads. Keep your paintings. Keep your nookchucks. Keep your teeth from the tooth fairy. For they all are there to remind you that you have a divine destiny with a God whose presence is always near. As for the stuff that makes up the golden calf, leave it at the foot of the mountain, for your journey is never backwards. It is always forward to the promised land. Amen. I invite you to join me in our closing prayer, and then, as always, we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer, and I hope you will join us at home. And let us pray. In this silent moment, let's let some space open up within us and around us. Space where the words that we've heard can settle, where the music of worship can soften us, and where we can reflect. Today we talked about the things that keep us from wholeness and health and happiness. The false idols that whisper to us that we are not good enough or not capable enough. Help us, God, to still those voices, to replace them instead with the whispers of faith, courage, compassion, and joy. We know how easy it can be to turn back, to retreat, to enslave a part of us because it might feel safe. But instead, we know that you invite us to keep moving forward, to be open to new possibilities. Guide us gently, but with purpose into this week. Aware of the ways that your spirit is in our midst. May the beauty of life that we see with our eyes and hear with our ears and touch with our hands nourish the beauty of a soul at peace in you. Continuing in prayer, we think about what else we're praying for today. This week we heard of troubling times, but also hopeful times with COVID. And we are grateful for all the healing and help that is happening. Help us to stay the course of exercise and caution, but always with a hopeful eye to a brighter future. This week we watched as justice was served in a courtroom in the U.S., giving us a greater hope for equality and justice for those who feel marginalized. And always remind us that despite difficult news, there's always good news. This week, babies were born, couples were married, jobs were found, relationships were started. Spring continued its march to renewal. There's always good in the world when we look for it. And hear us now as we share our own quiet prayers with you. Spirit God, move in us, with us, and through us this week in all that we do, that we may be your instruments of peace, love, and justice in our homes, in our communities, 
and in our world. And here, as thou is together, we sing the words of the Lord's Prayer. Well, thank you again for joining us, spending some of your Sunday here with us at Northwest. I hope you have a fantastic week ahead. I'd like to end with words of benediction, and then we will sing together, Go Now in Peace. Go from this place today, filled with God's abundant love. Go from this place today, filled with God's love in your heart. Go from this place today and share this abundance and this love with others. Go from this place today and know that God is grateful. For each and every one of you, go from this place, go in peace, and go with grace. Amen. Mm -hmm.